Are you going to eat? Yeah, control. You're going to get yourself in the doghouse right off the bat this morning. Those who see the cute side of Tennille, she's, she's pretty. Yeah, she looks like it'd be a lot of fun. <laughs> Some days, not so much. Stop. Tennille is 19. She has a chromosome disorder that is unique to Tennille. Can you talk a little bit about what it's like to be Tennille's mom? I don't know how not to be Tennille's mom. Being mom to a 19-year-old who is, for all intents and purposes, a two or three-year-old, is all of the issues that you have with a two or three-year-old, except for you can't pick them up on your hip and walk away when there's a behavior. No, no toy. No toy. Your cup's at the table. When they soil themselves, you can't just go into the restroom and pull out the changing table. It's hard. She needs you to do everything for her. You ready to go play? Tammy Schwab has been struggling to get help from the state of Pennsylvania. Her daughter, Tennille, is one of over 12,000 adults with an intellectual or developmental disability on a waiting list to receive support services. What are you trying to get for Tennille right now? What kind of care are you trying to get for her? Anything. We've got nothing. The system is so broken, I don't, I don't know that they can fix anything. They need to throw it away. Push. Help, please. Tennille is entitled to a nurse through the state's waiver program, which uses Medicaid dollars to pay for in-home care and services for adults with disabilities. Trying to fall down on me. But the system is overloaded, and it's been months since anyone came to the house. Got it. While she waits, Tammy's been using her vacation days to take care of Tennille. She's almost out. Want another one? It's yucky. I'm going to be 60. I keep saying that to myself. I'm going to be 60. Oh my god, I'm going to be 60. Neil's lucky. She don't have to carry water or feed. She just has to throw bread. I can't imagine going to work Come on, Angel. 40 hours a week to be able to pay my bills and to sustain us. Shoes are off, I see. At the end of the day, I am so tired. We don't want to be pitied. We just want some help. Across the country, there are nearly 600,000 people with disabilities like Tennille on waiting lists to get government-funded help. Everything from in-home care to placement in homes with 24-7 nursing. These wait lists are a symptom of a struggling system that often fails to meet the needs of what's arguably the country's most vulnerable population. There are deep structural problems. Problems in a workforce, problems in just the system itself. You may be entitled to a service, but you can't access it. Why? There's not enough money. There's just a, a difficulty of matching entitlements to actual access for services. For the families who are on these waiting lists and they can't access the care, what are they supposed to do? Uh, hope and pray. Thomas, what'd you have for lunch today? Can you tell me? Mm. Sandwich, was it good? Mm. Yeah, I bet you it was because I watched you eat it. Dennis Downey's interest in this is personal. His son Thomas has cerebral palsy and autism. Thomas lives in a group home paid for by the state. This model of care places a few individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities together in a house in a residential neighborhood. 30 years ago, he might have ended up in an intermediate care facility, a large, isolated institution that costs tens of millions of dollars a year to run. But most states are phasing these out. Pennsylvania only has four public ICFs left. 16 states have closed them altogether. Can you speak to the shift that Pennsylvania has made from the institutional model to the group home model? Why is that happening? There's a growing advocacy movement that became more and more critical of the institutional model, which, as Justice Thurgood Marshall said, was simply warehousing people for life. There's a very strong eugenics impulse in this, trying to not only socially isolate, marginalize, but actually to weed out that element of the population. A group of Democratic lawmakers is planning to introduce the Home and Community-Based Services Access Act, 
which would allocate more federal funding for the group home model to eliminate all state waiting lists, make it easier for people to access group home care, and increase staff pay to attract a more stable and skilled workforce. But some parents feel left out of this attempt to improve the system. The community failed him again and again. He was ultimately rescued by Whitehaven Center, the intensive and compassionate care of an intermediate care facility. We don't choose Whitehaven because we don't know what's out there. We choose Whitehaven because we do. Sue Jennings is fighting to keep Pennsylvania's institutions open. She's even sued the state over it. Her 29-year-old son, Joey, has lived at Whitehaven Center for the last five years. But the state plans to close it next year. How did you feel when you first had to make that decision, when you first realized that you couldn't keep Joey at home? Very conflicted because I wanted to keep him at home. But I, I couldn't do it. And I was older, I was aging. In the space of four years, he was in and out of five different group homes. He always ended up in a single-person group home. He'd start out with roommates, and then his behaviors were so unmanageable that they put him in his own little, solitary, single-person group home every single time. Is this where you usually come to visit him? Uh, no, I, we take go to Hemlock Hall. Vice News requested to visit Joey, but was not permitted to set foot on the grounds. At Susan's request, Whitehaven staff brought Joey to the gates to meet us. Come here, give me a big hug. What's your plan for Joey after Whitehaven closes? I don't really know. I'll be at a loss. Want to get on the other side and go sit in the van? There is no adequate plan in place for these adults that are going to need 24-hour, seven-day-a-week supervision in a stable, therapeutic environment with on-site treatment teams. It cannot be replicated in the home or in an apartment. They need a more intensive care than do these other dis- Don't lump us in with them. We're different, and we have different needs. Mm, thank you. I see ya. Do you feel like the current system has a good option for everyone who needs it? The challenge here for any system like this is you have to really look at an individual need and understand to the best of your ability at that moment what that person needs in terms of staff, training, personalities, and that can take extraordinary time and care. And sometimes we don't have that. Are there people who are falling through the cracks right now? Yes, there, there, are, there are people who have unmet needs uh, in the system, absolutely. And, you know, we, we need to, to get to those people. This is a, a historic issue that most states have struggled with. And, you know, it's, it's a matter of funding and political will. So it really just comes down to the money. Money is part of it, but I, I think part of the rest of this is a, a recognition of service professions, particularly human service professions, as really uh, essential and worthy positions. Even if the Home and Community-Based Services Access Act ultimately passes, the living arrangements available for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities will still be limited to a few options to fit a diversity of needs. For families, that often means accepting a solution they know is flawed. Do you worry about Thomas being lonely here? Every day of my life. Yeah. The issue of loneliness, isolation. You know, there's the the real concern. Who will love my child? And my wife's instinct from the very beginning was, who will take care of him when we can't? So in some respects, being a parent of someone with a disability is no different than being a parent to someone who is more typical. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in other ways, it's, it's life-altering for everybody. Right, Tom? Thomas, you changed my life. And you did. Oh, she's having breakfast. Tammy, did you set up this barn for for you or for Tennille, or how did it come well, together? It came, Tennille, 
Tennille liked being around the critters, and I like, obviously, I grew up around critters. But sensory-wise, especially when they're like these little babies, she really likes them. When we would go to places like Living Treasures, you paid $20 for me to get in and $20 for her to get in, and the other kids were enjoying it, and Tennille was being Tennille, and we had to leave. So for the days that she really likes them, she can come out at her, on her schedule, on her time frame. And, uh, and it, I can't go anywhere. Um, I mean, I can come to the barn, walk to Neil in her gated area, come down here for a few minutes, and then go back to the house. But I can't go meet my friends and socialize, because most of them don't want to socialize somewhere that would be Tennille friendly. It'd be like taking your newborn baby to a girl's night out. <laughs> you know, like, ah, uh, what'd you bring the kid for? You know, so it's just the way it is. Because of COVID, her physical therapy got train wrecked. And that's part of the reason. Normally, I would have been able to bring her down here better. But her ankles are kind of the ankle part is tipping in. So it's like this. And her foot's turned out. And she's tippy-toeing, pronating on her toe. We've been trying to get a new wheelchair for Tennille since early December. We still don't have one. That car that she was sitting in, I can't really take her outside of home in it because the where the crotch strap hooks into the seat is broke. She can slide right out of it. It's just a nightmare. <laughs>